those of you who don't know Vartsila that well, we, we are um, a Finnish-based company uh, in Finland. Uh, we, we have a, a very global, we're a truly global company based in, in 70 different locations. We have two offices here in South Africa, one in Joburg and, and one in Cape Town. Um, and, uh, and we have uh, done business in almost every country in the world with uh, more than 70,000 megawatts uh, of installed capacity around the world and about 7,000 megawatts on the African continent. So I will share a little bit about what we see happening and, um, in the, around the world and in Africa. And when I started in, in Barcelona about 20 years ago, um, the energy sector was, was quite... Um, it was, there was not that much drama. It was quite predictable. You knew what uh, the utilities were making, the long-term plans on uh, capacity and peak demand uh, and, and that basis. And this, uh, this kind of uh, situation uh, continued, uh, I would say, up to about 2014. And, and at this time, something changed. And um, up to that point, uh, the cheapest source of electricity was coal and gas, depending on which part of the world you were in. But then came renewables and changed everything. Uh, today, in 2019, renewables is the cheapest source of, of, of electricity in two-thirds of the world. And in 10 years from now, we believe it's going to undercut uh, and become the cheapest virtually everywhere in the world. So, what happened? Well, here's, here's a, a bit of a road that we see ahead. Uh, this is something we see happening. Um, we, we started in the good old days when there were no renewables. Uh, renewables were simply too expensive and, and we, it was very easy to plan uh, because you had dispatchable technologies and predictable demand. But then uh, renewables started increasing, cost came down and scale, economies of scale drove the implementation. Today we are at this point where you have 20% renewables uh, in, in many countries. And, uh, and it has reached what we call a tipping point. And the tipping point means that renewables reach grid parity and become more cost effective than other sources of energy. This is where we're at today in, in two thirds of the world. And I would say the, the scary thing, or, or the good thing, depending on how you look at it, is that you can no longer stop renewables. As long as your decision making is based on uh, climate uh, impact or economic uh, impact, uh, renewables is always going to win. And uh, this is going to impact a lot of things. When you continue the trend up to 80% renewables, the inflexible generation like coal and baseload gas is going to stop functioning. They, they will no longer have a role to play in the system because it's completely eaten up by the renewables. And this is when flexible generation becomes uh, uh, the key to solution, including energy storage. And the way to get to 100% renewable is, is simply that uh, you have to um, make uh, natural gas into biogas. And this can be done through power to gas uh, technologies, which will be available in the, in the next 10 years. This is the trend that we see uh, globally happening, and this is such a core issue that we have actually made this the strategy of Vartsila Energy around the world. Uh, we, as, we, are, we are a company that traditionally build gas and uh, gas, gas power plants, which is not renewable, but we realize that we have no choice. We have to follow this. We cannot resist renewables anymore. It's, uh, it's gone to that point. Um, here's what Bloomberg thinks. Um, lots of graphs. Just what I want to <coughs> highlight here is the trend that we see. So on, uh, on renewables on the top, wind and solar will, will continue to increase in, uh, as they have in the past. In 10 years from today, uh, they will increase by two or three times uh, in, in the deployment compared to where the rate is today. Thermal capacities will, will basically decline, uh, coal, base load gas, and so on. Flexibility is, is a bit different. We believe hydro and pumped hydro is going to eventually phase out, uh, or uh, at least a new deployment, because there will be cheaper alternatives available. Demand side management is going to uh, increase of importance, but the, 
the real growth is really on battery storage and peaker gas. These will not double or triple in size. They will increase by 12, 13 times compared to where they are today. Looking at these, uh, what does flexibility mean? Um, and what are the technologies to solve that? This is showing uh, the, the causes uh, and the issues utilities and dispatchers and system operators face on a daily basis on managing the, the flexibility and generation in the grid. Uh, the more renewables you have, the more issues you will have uh, to solve this. They, they have to deal with frequency regulation, they have to optimize spinning reserves, they have to look into uh, how to manage the peaks, uh, they have to look into transmission and distribution, uh, and so on. We believe the technologies, uh, there are many technologies to, to solve this issue, but we see two primary ones. Uh, Lithium-ion battery is, is an emerging technology which today has uh, become the technology and we believe this is going to be the one for the future because it's so heavily driven by the electric vehicle industry that they already have a critical mass and um, uh, that's that's just going to increase the problem with the batteries is that you cannot fix all the flexibility issues with them because um, today they they are basically able to uh, cover up to a couple of hours of, of storage uh, and, and shifting of solar, but going beyond that, it becomes too expensive because uh, you will simply have too many batteries uh, lined up to, to manage such a duration. In the future, we believe the cost of batteries is going to follow a similar reducing trend in price that we have seen in PV. Um, but even if it would drop by 80, 90% in costs, you will never be able to solve 100% of your flexibility needs with batteries because you sometimes have days, weeks, months and even uh, seasonal variations which impacts your flexibility needs. So for this you need to have what we call flexible gas and uh, this, this will always be part of a system uh, with, with uh, lots of renewables. So looking at these flexible gas technologies uh, I know we have people here from, uh, from gas turbine companies. Um, we, we see it like this, that a gas turbine, that's, that's something you have on airplanes, because it is the best technology for high load, stable uh, dispatch at high efficiency. Extremely re reliable technology and, and very efficient. Um, but when you, when you have to do quick starts and stops, like cars, they use combustion engines. This technology is designed for uh, being quick to start, quick to stop. You can run for a couple of minutes or uh, an hour, long term, it doesn't matter. It can run whichever way you like. You just push the start button and the stop button when you want it to stop. Um, I think the, the um, gas turbine uh, uh, has, has a role to play in the future, but it will become more and more challenging because uh, when you have rapid starts and stops, gas turbine technology will really struggle to follow it. Um, this table you see here is, is actually an extract from the, the latest IRP, and you see all of these technologies mentioned here. So you have combined cycle gas turbines, combined cycle gas engines, and open cycle of the same uh, turbines and, and internal combustion engines. So they are part of the, the IRP as well. Um, moving a little bit away from technology for the moment, uh, we have, since the last 10 years, uh, been doing a lot of power system studies. We do this so we can understand how is the market working and what is the best way to optimize the cost of generation. And, and today we, we have done over 70 countries. In fact, we have done every country on the African continent. Uh, and I think that the trends that we see from here is, uh, is quite interesting. Um, this, uh, I, I will show a case study where you have a typical week on an hourly basis, how a system operates if you have 50% renewable capacity. Uh, we, we've seen this kind of trend in, in, uh, in almost every country, uh, some variations, but this is very uh, typical, I would say, even for Africa. So solar PV would, would generate something like this. This is the, the midday and here the sunset and the next day it goes on. So you have seven peaks during a week. 
That's a typical solar generation. When you add wind, it's slightly different. This is uh, a bit more stable, but it's still very difficult to predict in, in, uh, in the longer term. You can make quite accurate predictions on day ahead, but you can never know is it going to be high or low. So you need to have a flexibility to adjust for that. So when you combine these two, you get the orange graph, and then you match this with the actual demand in the system. The difference between this, you see on the blue line, and just to clean up this, this chart, this is what flexibility means when you have 50% renewables in the system. So the blue line is what you have to do. And this simply cannot be done with coal plants. Uh, it cannot be done by base load gas plants. You need more flexibility. Increase this 50% to 80% renewable, it becomes even more dramatic. But you need this full capacity because at some point in time, sun will be down and there will be no wind. While at other times, you, you don't need any thermal capacity. So a couple of case studies. Uh, this is a, a project from uh, Texas in US. The number, magic number here, 1,192. It means this is the number of starts of Arzel 160 megawatt gas plant uh, went through during the year 2016. This was not because of some problems in the grid or issues with testing and commissioning. This was the normal way of operating because this plant was dedicated to balance wind and solar capacity in, in Texas. Uh, this, this red line you see here is uh, uh, an extract from the control system of the power plant during a period of roughly two weeks. So you can see that it's, it's starting and stopping. It's mostly on standby. It's doing a bit of frequency regulation here and very rapid and unpredictable supply. But this is what it, it has to do. Another case study um, in, uh, in Australia, a utility called uh, AGL, they, they had an existing 1,000 megawatt coal plant, which they were planning to invest uh, a substantial amount of money to extend the life. Our team in, in Australia, they, they did this kind of study for them and said, well, why don't you decommission your coal plant and build massive amounts of renewables instead? 1,600 megawatts, and then you add a 250 megawatt gas peaker. This is your first phase. And then in the second phase, you expand with more gas and, and uh, renewables. The conclusion was an extension of the coal plant would have given a, a levelized cost of electricity of 106 euro, um, dollars per megawatt hour, while the alternative would actually be down at 83, a 15% or 20% reduction in cost of generation, while reducing substantially the emissions. AGL placed the order for this uh, option last year, and it's due to be commissioned quite soon. So it's happening. It's, it's not uh, just desktop studies. This is reality. Looking at South Africa, uh, this is uh, what the IRP is forecasting uh, as, of, as of today. Uh, the current, uh, we have done lots of models on South African power grid, and this is roughly what the system looks like today. Most of the generation is done by coal, and then there's some renewables and, and uh, intermittent plants. By 2030, we will have uh, substantial more renewables and more gas peakers and slightly lower uh, coal output. By 2040, you will have uh, a little bit more renewables, but uh, this is also a bit restricted uh, the, way, the way the IRP is, is today. So it says that more coal will be reduced, but you need more actually baseload uh, uh, type of, of um, solutions. Now, this is a good, good uh, I would say, trend, but we, just for the sake of it, we, we couldn't resist but run. What if South Africa would go 100% renewable? This is what the IRP would look like in that case. Jumping to 2040, you would have massive amounts of wind and solar in the system. There is no longer a role for coal. There is no longer a role for baseload uh, at all. It's all about flexibility through beaker gas and batteries which charge and discharge when you have over and shorted, oversupply and shortage of renewables. So what does this mean? Well, here we look at capacity in 2040, if we would follow this. Uh, today we are here, 
around 60 gigawatts uh, installed capacity. The RP would take us in 2040 to about 100 gigawatts of installed capacity. If we would go to 100% renewable, uh, the cost of generation would drop from $44 a megawatt hour to 38. How is this possible? We're installing twice as much capacity. Well, it's because of the cheap renewables. They, they cannot be stopped. And, and it's, it's the most economical way to, to do it. And uh, looking at this side of the chart, we have the energy generated by different technologies. So the reduce, uh, emissions would re actually reduce uh, from 308 down to zero, while still lowering the cost. So it's, it's, uh, it's a nice, uh, challenging thought, and I know it's a bit provocative, but we believe uh, this is a trend that's happening internationally, and, and it's, it's simply not uh, possible to stop it in the long term. So my final slide, this is uh, an extract from the uh, IRP. What is, where is this taking South Africa? I think the conclusion here is there's a lot of wind and solar uh, in the system. There's uh, beaker gas uh, and, and uh, uh, storage in the system. Coal is uh, going to reduce from uh, 37 to 33. I think this is by 2030. <laughs> so extended another 10 years, you'll see this trend continuing. So I think it's, uh, South Africa is on the right path, and uh, uh, I think uh, it's, it's uh, going to be exciting to see the next steps.